All right, we're going to try this sucker again. Girl Eats World, episode one, take four. Hey guys, welcome to Girl Eats World, episode one. I finally made it. We here. I have had such a struggle to get this thing going. And I won't bore you with the details. But if I seem a little worked up, a little breathy, a little irritated, that's why. I apologize. I should be a little bit more professional and hide that shit. But I'm not going to. I don't feel like it. And it's my show. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much for being here. You are probably a friend of mine if you're listening to this right now. And if you are, I love you. Hi. You're the best. I wish we could hang out right now. And if I don't know you, if you or if you don't, and you don't know me, um, I thank you for tuning in. Wow, how'd you find me? That's awesome. Cool. I should send you a t-shirt or something when I make them. My name is Tina, otherwise known as Tina Bites on the internet. And I'm about to be your new best friend. I'm here for you, you know, while you're sitting in traffic and miserable and cursing at people. Just shh, just relax. Just accept it. And listen to me talk some shit. I'll try to make you feel better. I'll try to make you laugh. I'll try to make you think, you know. I'll do my best. Maybe you're sitting on the bus and you're sitting on the bus. Let's be real, okay? Riding the bus sucks. It, it's just a necessary thing if you want to help the world, make the world a better place. I get it. You know, I from the age of 18 to the age of 30... I lived without a car, so I get it. I've put in my dues, but I have not really taken public transit. Uh, I mean, I have, but, you know, I haven't really um, since. I haven't made it a priority. <laughs> so, yeah, I get it. Just close your eyes, listen to me as you head into work, as you head home from work. And speaking of work, maybe that's where you are right now. And it's, you know, the afternoon slump and you're over it. And you just need to get through the last few hours. I got you. I'm here. Let's do this. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm here to do. I, I'm sure you're wondering why, why I'm even here. Like, you're wondering, like, what, what's the deal? What's this Girl Eats World business? To be honest with you, I wish I could tell you, but that's kind of the beauty of this, is that I'm trying to explore myself what this means. It's a little bit of self-exploration, it's a little bit of um, narcissism, it's a little bit of, you know, authenticity going, I wanna, I wanna just express myself freely. I love talking shit and I'm embracing the fact that this is this is, this is what I want to nurture myself. <laughs> uh, and I want you to hear it. I want you to participate. I want you to, I want you to listen to me and feel better because I'm saying shit that you are thinking right now about what it is, whatever it is in your life, about the people in your life, about your job, about your family, about your internal dialogue and how you hate yourself or love yourself or whatever. It's all, it's all universal. I'll be telling my stories. I'll be asking you to send me your stories so we can, you know, commiserate or we can just have a laugh. And they're all unique to our lives. But ultimately, we all share the same, the same experiences in essence, right? And so that's, that's what this is. This is kind of, this is, this is community building also. But let's be real. It's also narcissistic, right? Because I've got video going. You see my face. You hear my voice. Why me? But I'm asking you, why not me? Okay? <laughs> see, I'm getting all worked up. My nose is running. <laughs> this is what happens when I get so emotional. Oh, my God. Also, I've just been running around trying to get my shit to work and not knowing why it doesn't sometimes. 
So I've got some notes just to help me out a little bit. And I apologize if my mic is a little hot because I'm screaming. I wanted to do this podcast for the the above mentioned reasons we just went through. But me personally, in my own personal life, I've been through some things. And a whole lot of it ended in question marks. And at some point, you just have to be your own answer. To put it in vague terms. We'll get specific in a second. Thank you for your patience. But my entire life, I've battled imposter syndrome. We all have. That's just what we do. We want approval. We want acceptance. We want to excel if we're lucky enough. And we try really hard. And some of us just end up running into walls every which way. Um, Maybe it's right away. Maybe it takes a few years. And we got to start over. We got to pick up and start over again. And for me, and I'll go into specific stories just because I have the floor. (laughs) But uh, generally speaking, it's It's been a whole lot of battling to to gain respect in the areas in which I believe that I'm supposed to do well in. So be that work, academia, be that the workplace. And I've just never felt like I fit in. And it's, it's even the, and here's my negative self-talk coming in, so forgive me. But even as I say that out loud, I hate hearing that because it's an excuse. It's a bunch of bullshit. What do you mean you don't fit in? Work a little harder. Study. I don't know. Work on your shit. But sometimes it be like that, okay? I don't know. I've tried really hard. And at some point, after a whole lot of rejection, a whole lot of like trying my best, but then things not always turning out exactly how I was hoping. And I mean, a lot of times, a lot, a lot of times. It does something to you. And I'm not saying that I'm like completely flatlined and and I quit. It's just more like, you know, you get a little tired, you get a little weary. And at some point, I actually lost my voice. And I mean that figuratively, but I also mean that literally. I remember when it started to happen. It was around uh, the presidential election in 2016. I'm sure it was just a coincidence. But I remember from that point on feeling myself lose my ability to articulate my own thoughts. And I don't know if part of it was just like an outcome of getting a little bit older and some of that goes, which how many years ago was that? I was only 31. So that's, but hey, maybe. Um, But also this imposter syndrome led, led me to a point in which I was looking for signs to support that. Support that people could see right through my shit. For example, I'm really sensitive to people tuning me out. Like as I'm talking in meetings, I can see signs of people completely no longer paying attention. It's in their eyes. It's in their body language. It's in the way they speak over you. So I developed a habit of speaking over people in order to be heard, which is not cute because I, I'm all about listening. Uh, I would say it's one of my strong suits. And so when I see actions that violate that, it, it really irks me. And, and I mean, okay, so it irks me if I'm supposed to be taken seriously, like in the workplace. But it's also your prerogative. If you don't want to listen to me, then I just won't talk. Like that, and that's fine. That's, that's cool. But sometimes I need to be talking. So... It, it sucks when I act, see people actively not listening. And then even more annoying, if people do respond to you, they kind of are condescending or patronize you and they treat you like 
you know, you haven't been a working woman for like 10 plus years. Um, I'm sure a lot of that is me projecting on folks. Everybody's got their insecurities that they just, they have a hard time with. And it's just a clash, a clash of insecurities. <laughs> yeah. Um, but that doesn't change how I felt and how I continued to feel. Um, and so this podcast is me trying to reclaim my voice, try to find it. And in me telling my stories, talking about life, hopefully there's something in it that you can relate to and that I could be speaking for you, you know, make you feel better a little bit because you're not alone in whatever it is that you're going through or what you're feeling. It's all some human shit. You know, and how we, how we take ownership of our lives, it all looks different for everybody. You know, for me, for you, for me, it just happens to be this podcast. For you, it could be something else entirely, but I want to excite, I want to help excite you about your shit by talking about my shit. Does that make sense? I hope it does, because I'm going to keep doing it. Um, yeah, I want to make every show have a topic just to keep me focused because you see me checking my notes if you're watching the video right now, you know, cause I want to stay on track. So today's topic, breakthroughs and breakdowns. What were the major pivotal moments in your life that changed things forever? That sounds really corny. Not, not change things forever. They never change once and then that's it. But they change a lot of times. But, it, you know, these, these moments shape your life and change course a little bit. Maybe take you places you didn't expect to go. Um, yeah. So I wanted you to share those with me. It doesn't have to be super dramatic. It could be like a lot of little things that just take you to where you are right now is just probably the most, the more likely scenario. Um, but maybe something, something major happened. Like you had a baby and now you're a mom. That's pretty, pretty uh, tremendous. But I asked a bunch of you who follow me on Instagram and who are my friends, what were those, some of those moments? And I got some interesting responses. Um, let's see, I have a list of them here. One, I stopped listening to other people's opinions and started listening to my own voice and body. I can relate to that. Two, realizing I don't have to live up to my parents' expectations. Uh, realizing I don't have to live up to my parents' expectations was completely freeing. Another one, a death of an aunt that raised me, a loss of a child, the end of a relationship, all within two months. That's intense. When external things happen to you and you have to somehow go about your life and take care of yourself and move forward. That's hard. That's tough. Um, realizing I have depression and doing something about it. That, I mean, that care, that's all of those really resonate. We all have those moments. Um, and it's interesting because I, I, I worded the question, what, it, what are your breakthroughs and breakdowns? And a lot of people shared with me their breakdown moments the negative moments really stick with us. And they're also um, key for us, right? Key character building moments, which is why they stick with us. If you, if you look back on your life, those stand out the most. So I try to remind myself of that, you know, in the moment when things are hard. Um, of course, nobody's perfect. I'm not perfect for sure. And I definitely feel the negative feelings and that's okay. Because if you don't, then you're just repressing things and compartmentalizing them. I don't really trust people who, who do that solely. You've got to break down a little bit in order to open up room to, to do something about it. But sometimes in the moments in which it becomes too difficult, you just have to remind yourself that you're about to get on the other side. You just got to be patient about it. And that in the end, you're going to come out better for this. So I thought that was interesting. A lot of your stories you shared with me were quite intense. Um, 
but you overcame them, you know? The, like lack of acceptance from the people around you, even though when you say those words, it doesn't seem like a whole lot, but in practice, it's like day to day, your own support circle, if they keep on not seeing what about you makes you you and they want to push you in particular directions or give you a hard time and don't let you figure your own stuff out, it can be really, really taxing at best and it could be really painful at worst right when you feel like you can't be yourself or that you don't have support and that you're alone that's awful but if you can find the strength within yourself to be your own support system that's fucking awesome so kudos to you if you manage to do that and if you're still working on it I got you um Okay, you know, let's just get into some story time. I feel like I've been talking a lot about stuff like kind of high level, like vague, vague uh, mentions of things. But I sort of want to just, I got pretty nostalgic when I was preparing for this podcast, um, thinking about my life, thinking about what I've been through, thinking about what, what did I do wrong and why am I in this position in the first place? You know, like... I, um, I mean, fuck it. Let's just talk about specifics. So I just moved to LA and trying to do the damn thing, trying to find a job because it's expensive out here. It's expensive in a lot of places. I've lived, um, in Seattle and San Francisco and I chose the most expensive places. I guess New York is next on the list and, uh, there will be other towns to join that list, but of expensive cities. I'm not moving anymore. But, um, yeah, I have really struggled, you know, job hunting is an interesting practice. You, you have to take everything that you've experienced in a professional capacity and sometimes even personal, whatever, whatever you can leverage. And you've got to enhance them and make them a lot sexier than they were make yourself sound like you were more significant than you were, Um, embellish, pick and choose details to make it sound like you are the shit, and then hopefully get hired and for them to realize like, oh, this person's still got a lot to learn, right? That's the real storyline. And God, the process of looking for work and trying to pretend like I give a shit about or that I could even be excited about trying to help companies sell their shit or download something like an app or whatever. I, I just, it started to feel like lying and begging for something I didn't even want to do. (laughs) It's really painful. Excuse me. It's so painful. It's bringing up my, my, uh, gastrointestinal issues. Just kidding. That's gross. I'm just burping. Oh, yes. I'm sorry if you tuned out at that point, but, um, yeah, it's just, it just started to feel like lying and begging and I just could not do it anymore. Lying and begging to do something that I didn't even want to do in the first place. It's just a necessity because I need to make a living. Which is ironic, that statement, making a living. A lot of us don't actually have a whole lot of time to live um, because we're too busy trying to make a living. Just making money is pain, painful um, necessity. But what was I even saying? Jesus Christ, Tina. Right, job hunting it is miserable. And I can't, I'm not, I'm not getting, see, it's a direct result. This show is a direct result of me not getting hired. It's a blessing in disguise because it's forcing me to do this, right? This is what, this is what I'm getting at here. This, this show is me just going for my dreams and hopefully to inspire you to go for your dreams. But first we're going to talk about what went wrong and Let's go all the way back. Let's go all the way back to just high school. Let's just go back to high school. That's fine. I 
was always an overachiever to start, to start. Okay. Like, I, but I went as far as about 10th grade being an overachiever. And then something happened. You know, overachiever is in school was actually kind of easy, which is probably part of the problem. Um, and doing really well on tests that just came naturally, learning things by just sitting in, like, I didn't need to, to reinforce information by doing homework. And uh, did you hear the dog barking? My neighborhood gets spicy sometimes. So if you hear stuff, don't worry about it. But I, at some point when I hit 10th grade and it was physics class specifically, something happened and the information that used to be so easy to take in, take the test, do well, check all the boxes, no big deal. I'm an exceptional student. It went from that to, oh, this is really confusing and I cannot understand anything <laughs> and uh, um, I don't care anymore. Oh God, that's so awful just saying that out loud. It's like, you lazy fuck, just fucking study, find people. But I was never really good at asking for help. That's another thing. That is not weakness to ask for help. Please ask for help if you need it, because there are resources and there are folks out there whose job is to help you in any, absolutely any category of anything. There are people, so find them. I did not do that, however. I just tuned out. And so I went from being an advanced student along with everybody else. My school and my class in particular was exceptionally smart um, and, and, and very multifaceted, but I didn't do so hot in physics and then um, calculus. I didn't understand. I mean, those two are related, obviously. So clearly I had a weak spot, a glaring weak spot that I did not fix. But instead of, instead of like trying harder, I thought that's all I had. And I stopped caring. I remember, and, and if any of my high school friends happened to ever listen to this, and they were in my class, <coughs> excuse me, they will attest to this. I, instead of taking my calculus final during, oh God, what year was that? It must have been junior year or sophomore year, but yeah, midway through high school, Instead of taking the final, I stayed home. I made some egg rolls for people. And I brought that big old platter of egg rolls into the classroom while people are frantically trying to finish the calculus final that I should also be taking. And I, so I, I just strolled, like I strolled up in there. I didn't go in there meekly, like, oh, my bad, like, I forgot, I didn't know, or something. I just boldly walked up in there with a platter in my hand, like a waitress. I was going in to serve folks. And my poor teacher, she was actually pretty dope. I, I wish I remembered her first name so I could see if she's still alive and if she's still, like, cool as fuck. Because <laughs> instead of being... Um, what you would expect, which is like a punitive, like, you know, scolding me or whatever, um, disciplining me for, for skipping class, basically skipping finals, kind of big, kind of big. I don't even know what I got out of that class. Maybe I, maybe I did decently well in the final, like I could have failed and gotten a B or something. That's probably what really happened, but I felt like it was an assholeish and pretty bold fucking move to not give a fuck. But anyway, she could have completely kicked my ass and she didn't. I remember the look on her face. She kind of just smirked in, in, in a way where she was kind of like, you know, that's fucked up, but I have mad respect for you right now because of how much you don't care. Um, and it was one of my proudest moments. I mean, it's, it's like one of my proudest and also one of my most shameful. There's a, there's a couple of those, uh, during that time of my life, but Hey, that's what I did. That's what I felt. That's what was in my heart. That's what I felt like doing. I was like, you know what? I am not a slave to this. I am not going to 
subject myself to this when I don't even know what it is I want to do with my life. And I've made it all the way to calculus. I mean, okay, like, damn, I think I have decent enough life skills uh, so far if, if, if life skills were measured by, you know, very traditional academic topics, but whatever. Um, I made it that far. So failing that, it's like, okay, well, I'm already kind of ahead, right? Who knows calculus? What adult knows calculus? Except for the ones that like build the planes that have been crashing and shit. Um, so that was me in high school. I also like in English wasn't doing so hot in the, I, so our advanced placement classes were called IB classes. Those are international baccalaureate. I don't know if that's truly an international thing and that you even know what I'm talking about, but just basically they're advanced. And those English classes were, I mean, I thought I was, I thought I, I, I could hang, but my essays always got the like much lower scores than I thought, like B's and shit. And I thought I made good points, but some, something in my, in my thesis, theses, and all my papers and all my supporting stuff just didn't cut it. And so I would get really bad grades. And I just was really kind of fed up. I was fed up with um, not understanding how I could not. And it's, it's, it's hilarious thinking about this now because I'm sure I only got B's. But it felt like at the time it was much worse than it was because it was new, not doing well. And I got mad and I, I was, I, in my eyes, thought I was trying pretty damn hard. Um, and I kind of stuck a big old middle finger up in the air and that's that. That's how I ended up. Oh my God. I'm, I need to reevaluate whether or not I'm actually proud of this. I kind of am. I kind of am. Fuck it. I am. I've never really accepted authority. So you can imagine why I'm working in for anybody is sort of difficult for my stupid ass. Oh man. But yeah. So high school was that. And I remember like going to my counselor's office. I wish I remember her name right now. I wouldn't say it like on the podcast, but I remember being so frustrated and I, I was close to graduating. I think I already had enough credits really, to be honest. Um, but I still had so much more to go and I felt completely unhappy and not sure where my place was because in the advanced classes, I'm either not like, I, I'm not really clicking with the material or something or straight up, you know, like calculus, it confuses me. Um, or like when I take regular classes, like I, I, I left IB English and went to regular English and those class discussions were I don't know how to say it in in any kind of way it was really bad the the knowledge gap the intellectual gap is significant <laughs> and there's no there's no middle class basically um which is which is a big issue in our educational system but I just didn't know like that, that made me even more passionate, passionless because I wasn't being challenged in those classes. So then here I am crying to my counselor. Like I, for the first time I'm asking for help because I'm that devastated by just being so confused already. And I hadn't even made it to college yet. And she was like, Hey, there's this program at a trade school. It was the district trade school. So she, you know, she was like, they are starting this new program. Nintendo wants to teach high school students how to make video games. And <laughs> she had asked me like what my passion was. And I, oh my God, I completely forgot about this. But I said, I wanted, I love movie magic. <laughs> and there was a show back then on Dis uh, Discovery Channel called Movie Magic, I think. I'm pretty sure. And it spent the entire episode just sharing how filmmakers like, do special effects, really. It wasn't really CGI based. It was mostly like actual mechanical stuff in real life happening, um, special effects. But I, I, I told her that that was something that I was really into and that I had an interest in filmmaking. 
And so that's why she introduced this Nintendo <laughs> video game class. She was like, I don't know, but it requires a little bit of math. It requires um, some artistic eye because there's computer animation. Maybe you should try it. Long story short, I did. I didn't do very well in any of the three areas. So it was math. It was like pro and programming, coding. Ugh. Ugh. And then computer animation. And my drawing skills are, are not that hot. So what ended up happening was I, d I didn't do so hot in all those areas. But what I was good at was I was good at being a girl in a class of a bunch of dudes. So then they used me as an example and sent me everywhere to talk about the damn program when I could not design a video game to save my life, but I could talk about it. And the best in the class was a, you know, kind of a nerdy kid who wasn't really good at public speaking. So we made a great pair. I wish I remembered his name. I would look him up too, just to see where everybody's at. I'm sure he runs his own company. Now. I'm sure he's a fucking millionaire. But yeah, what is my fucking point? What am I even talking about right now? There was, oh God, that reminds me. So speaking of art and all that, I, I can't remember if this came before or after. It might've been after this video game situation, but then I was like, you know what? Fuck it. I'm already, I have enough to graduate of everything. And I haven't taken any electives, so I'm just going to go and take all these art classes. So I, I abandoned every single, like, regular topic, English, math, uh, science, biology, whatever, all that. And I signed up for um, ceramics, watercolor, drawing, calligraphy. And I did take an English class. I think I still needed that credit but I took science fiction. So, so I've read Dune. So I get, I get it when people uh, refer to that book, but that's about all I got from that. <laughs> it was a great class though. It was really interesting. Um, and I mixed it up a little bit, but basically I kind of, I, I owned feeling like a fuck up and just had fun with it at that point. Um, so I guess that's not quite a breakdown moment in my life, but those are some key, like I, I've been reflecting a lot about my life as I was preparing for this podcast. And that's, I just w was thinking about all the times in which I was trying to do what I was supposed to do. And I just could not find my way. It took me seven years to get my fucking bachelor's degree. Why? Because I bounced around everywhere, not sure what I wanted to do with myself. It's crazy. Why? God. But it's true. That's what happened. It's like something looks cool and I jump in there and I don't know. It's not quite there. It's not quite driving or I don't really have the skills that it takes or even with some work. It just, it just wasn't, I just didn't have the talent because I don't know. And then here we are. I don't even know what I'm good at until I realize I'm good at talking shit and I should just own it. And here we are. So many people make a living out of talking shit on the internet. Why not me? But yeah, God, seven years to take my, you know, seven years to get my bachelor's. The, the things that I learned are, were all life stuff. I lived in San Francisco during that time. And I partied four or five nights out of the week. And that was fun times, but it also was really detrimental to my health. <laughs> Mental, emotional health. And I had, a, I had a job at the time and school, so no wonder I didn't do so hot. It was just spread thin, trying to have a social life. I never partied in high school ever. I did. I barely had friends in high school. I had friends that I knew because my, my, um, they were the kids of my parents' friends, but so I tried to make up for it in college, you know, what else did I learn from it? I, I became stronger out of, because of all the 
relationships that I had that didn't work out. All the shitty boys that gave me a chip on my shoulder. Just kidding. Just kidding, but also totally serious. I remember, and this may be TMI, whatever, I don't care anymore. In 2019, is it really TMI? We're all about honesty now, right? And I love a good TMI. Um, but I'm not going to go into like nasty details or anything. But yeah, I got HPV when I was 22 from a dude that I was really, you know, like I, I was really enamored with him, but he was kind of a piece of shit at the time. He may still be a piece of shit. I don't know. I don't really talk to him, but, um, yeah, that was hard. I mean, speaking of pivotal moments, I don't know about pivotal, but it's definitely significant. When you're 22 years old, you're still very, you're super green and you get this like information about yourself and you have no support system, like nobody older to talk to who've been around the block, you know, to look at you and say, hey, all adventurous women do. They, they get HPV, you know, three out of four people. You can't even prevent it with condoms. It's just skin to skin contact and sex is messy. Um, nobody was there to do that. And so I kind of freaked out. And, oh, by the way, my doctor at the time, my gynecologist, was a fucking bitch. I think she was judging me for having extramarital sex. Premarital sex? Not extramarital, my bad. I'm not married, or I wasn't married at the time. Premarital. I know English, guys. Um, I think she was judging me for having premarital sex. Because I was 22, I looked even younger, and here I am coming to her with, uh you know, trans, sexually transmitted, um, disease. And she told me I was all fucked up down there, covered in warts, and that I needed this, um, cream. And it was $500 or something ridiculous. And after insurance, it was $300. And I did not have the money at the time because I was not working, just focused on school. And it was devastating. I was fucked up. I didn't, I mean, not only was I heartbroken over somebody, but then also this guy fucking gave me this thing because he was only the second person I'd ever been with at that point. What an adventure. What an adventure. I, this actually, so this instance was, is part of the reason, well, for a lot of reasons. I support Planned Parenthood through and through till I, the day I die because I left that gynecologist's office. I went to get a second opinion at a Planned Parenthood. They checked me out and they're like, you know, I, we don't know what that doctor was saying and talking about because you're fine. Um, just come in if something, you know, shows up and we'll remove it. But you're chill. And that was that. And then I went back to that doctor's office um, and I wish I had the courage back then to stand up to her and point out how fucked up she was for making me feel that way, um, a young girl in the world, but I didn't. Instead, what I did was, and I didn't do it on the internet, like I didn't write a review or whatever, because that's awkward, like I'm going to talk about my HPV di diagnosis on Yelp <laughs> when I have nothing else, just that. Um, so yeah, so there's no resource or no outlet, uh, at the time, but I did go back and I went to one of her colleagues instead to, to continue my, just my checkups and whatnot. Um, and I vented to her and I told her that her colleague was garbage, um, and how she made me feel and all that. And I don't know if that woman ever told, told my original doctor, um, how I felt and what she did to me, but... Gosh, I wish I can go back and, and, and do that a little bit differently. Because she was terrible. So much judgment. She's a doctor in San Francisco. That can't be the first person she's ever met to do that. Like, what? Yeah. Sex is a fun topic. We could talk about it in a future show. I used I, I, I love that topic. It's a lot of fun. Um... HPV isn't fun, though, because you deal with that for a while every time you go to the doctor. I'm good now. It's been too long. 
it's, <laughs> it's been like 13 years. Wow. Um, anyway, what else happened back then? Well, speaking of being sad and depressed or whatever, I had a lot of bouts of that, um, at that time. And I never really did anything about it because I didn't know, I didn't, I didn't want to make time for it. I didn't, I, I'm not even sure if I had, um, health coverage for, you know, uh, therapy. I didn't, I didn't pursue it. I should have, but part of the reason why it took me so long to finish school, honestly, was that I had a hard time getting out of bed for extended periods um, like a stretch of a few days at any time that it hit really hard. So actually I was going to say that it was really bad when I was living alone, but that's not true. I actually was doing that while living with people, um, and probably ruining some pretty good, um, friendships, N not like, not like intentionally, but just as an effect of me kind of shutting, shutting down, shutting out, um, these people, but I would just not be able to face the day and I would stay in bed and I would stay in bed all day through the night, through the next day. And if it was bad enough, I wouldn't even, um, I think, I think I, I managed to go to work because I needed to, right. I need to make money to, to keep living there, but that was as far as I could go. Um, beyond that, like school definitely went to the wayside. I wouldn't show up to class quite often because, you know, I never, I never lived in like an on-campus dorm. It was always off campus, um, just because of the way of the school that I'd gone, gone to specifically. But then, um, as I got older, I definitely didn't live in a dorm situation when I changed schools. Anyway, blah, blah, blah. too many details, but I, it made it hard to go to school because it, it was a lot more of a more distance to travel in order to get there. And when you're in a, when you're in a mind state where you are unable to even really take care of yourself and all you want to do is shut down and sleep, of course, you're not going to make it to class. So I, God, I remember hi like when I would live with people, I would stay in bed and I would hide away and not... It just seemed like so much work to get up and take a shower and make myself presentable, um, let alone go and do anything beyond that and interact with people. And so I, I would like, yeah, I would, I would stay in my room and try to, I would hide from people. Like I would hide from if people had, if my roommates had guests over, um, even if they were out of town, I remember when my, my roommates had out of town guests. And so it was like very happening at the house, uh, at the apartment, a lot of people, a lot of really fun people, but I would hide away sometimes and just like, I would time my bathroom breaks, you know, for when they would be out or, or, or what have you. So I wouldn't run into anybody. Um, and yeah, that sucks. It was a lot of, but you know, I, I sort of accept it. Like I'm not, I'm not regretful or anything because it happened and I didn't do anything about it in the moment. And then there's no use in um, wishing I did it differently. Um, but I'm grateful that I had that experience because then I understand. I don't really know how one gets them selves out of that. When you, when you are in that mind state, it is impossible. Like you know all the logic and all the all the um, rationale like to get yourself out of that. But if you do not care, if you don't care about anything, you're not going to move. So, you know, I was probably even talking to myself then, like, if you just get up and do this one thing, it'll lead to another thing. But I just didn't want to. But uh, but as I've as I've gotten older. And that experience, you know, taught me a lot about myself. And what, I, what I've learned is when to recognize when that's coming. Um, I have bouts like that, but it's not, it's not as intense um, 
and helpless feeling. I, I feel more empowered to do things about it. One, I recognize when it's going to happen. I allow myself those, those, um, low energy days is what I call them now. And, um, Yeah, I recognize those little energy days and, and, and by anticipating them, I can kind of avoid letting myself sink in really deep. Part of it, actually, now that I'm saying it out loud, part of it is anytime I do something, and by that, I mean it as broadly as it sounds. Anytime I'm trying to do something, I have to do it to a certain degree. So it could be anything from the way I wash my dishes to the way I do my makeup to the way I um, do something more significant. I can't think of any of the example right now. Just like something you know, like homework or an essay or, you know, in the workplace, a project, a presentation, whatever. Like if I do anything, it's going to have to um, be a significant effort because the output, the outcome needs to be like of a certain standard for that particular thing. Um, but what that does, it, I, it's just a long winded way, honestly, of, of, um, being saying that I'm a perfectionist. Okay. That's what it, that's what it comes down to is that when I do things, I want them to, to be a certain way. And it's exhausting because I, I, I am a perfectionist in my expectations, but in my actions and in my heart, I'm not really. And so it's like a self-judgment all the time. So, so yeah, so that's part of the reason why I don't, I, I would have, I would struggle doing things because I just couldn't live up to my own expectations and it fucking exhausted me. So I quit on myself. I was like, fuck you, lady. You're not the boss of me. Oh, fuck. Yeah, you are the boss of me. What am I supposed to do? I guess I'll just sleep here for three days straight. That's crazy. I never really thought of it that way. But there you have it. Oh, what are we talking about? What am I doing here? Right. Um, pivotal moments. Well... I mean, we talked a lot about school, but, you know, in the workplace, it hasn't been any easier. I've gotten laid off a lot, you know, because I work for a lot of um, tech companies, new tech companies, startups, they call them. And maybe the idea isn't so hot, so things fall apart. And so the whole company goes away or the team that I'm on goes away. Um, and that's hard because, you know money is important and you're trying to get going. You're trying to fight off your debt at the same time. Also just live and it's really expensive to live, um, in some places. And when you work someplace for just a few months to a year, and then you don't work anymore, not by your, uh, not of your own choice, it can be hard. Um, so Having a few of those moments, and, and that's the, from a from a practical standpoint, it's very hard. But also, it's very hard on the psyche. It's on on the on the your morale. You wonder like how much of it is your fault because you're on the marketing team, um, and your job is to sell shit. So you put a lot of that on yourself. Um. But yeah, but when I think about some of the more um, hard hitting layoffs, because there's been more than one, it it would it would lead me to take a risk that I wouldn't have taken before because I was trying to just be in the rat race, make money so I can save money, pay my rent, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but during one of these times, I, you know, I was new to, um, working out, getting healthy and all that. And the subject is really intriguing. It's one of my passion areas, really. Um, I could talk about that forever, but because I was laid off, I decided to be a trainer, um, because that was something that I always wanted to do. 
Um, and I wouldn't have done it if I hadn't gotten laid off and was forced to. I was just really passionate about fitness because I was learning how to take care of myself after so many years of not doing so and, you know, getting a lot of weight is the external manifestation of that, but emotionally and, and, and mentally too, I, I needed to figure out how to reconnect everything and, and really feel revitalized, um, as a person and fitness did that for me. I ended up, uh, randomly deciding to take a kickboxing class. I'd done some other shit, some other bullshit to be honest, uh, you know, like bar and stuff <laughs> because I was, I was, I was too afraid and not confident to take the things that I, uh, the classes that I wanted to take. So namely combat sports, mixed martial arts. Like I, 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 I really was attracted to that. My sister was, um, studying, training Krav Maga and the stuff that she was learning was so badass. And I really wanted to do that, but I never regarded myself as an athletic person, especially because I, I hated PE and ball sports was just really nerve wracking because one thing I'm not good at is not caring what other people think and playing baseball or basketball and just being really bad at it was a nightmare, an absolute nightmare. And so I avoided that like the plague. My cardio is, is not so hot naturally. Like I, I can work at it, but if I don't, it's really bad. And that was another really bad time as far as like the mile run took me forever. I was always last, that kind of thing. Um, so I never allowed myself to see myself as an athletic person. And when you look at me, you probably don't, don't see me as an athletic, but I, um, I, and I, and you know, like I, I, I believe that of myself and that's really bad, but, um, I decided finally after getting in a little bit better shape at, or at least was really consistent with doing active stuff, I decided to take a kickboxing class and realized I had an aptitude for it and it went rolling from there. I became really passionate about that, took classes every day that I could, got to a point where my sensei, I guess, I never really called him that, I called him his first name, um, but he recognized that I was good at teaching, so I ended up teaching it just here and there when he needed a sub, um, and then when I got laid off, bless his heart, he hired me and had me teach classes. And I, I got really into it and I started going to a gym um, run by a former, like owned and operated by a former UFC fighter, Ivan Salivary. And I went there for a straight year, like every day, um, well, Monday through Thursday or something, because they had classes for, for pro fighters at other times. But I would go after work and I would learn how to wrestle. I would learn how to grapple. I would learn how to do jujitsu. Jiu um, and that really was different for me. And while, you know, while I wasn't good at it, like, I mean, obviously, like, how could you be good at that right off the bat? Unless you just happen to have those instincts. But unlike academics, where I was naturally good at a lot of subjects for a while until it got hard, and then I rejected it, because I felt like I just did, I, you know, like it wasn't for me or something. Like I, I didn't accept that I need to work harder. Physical stuff actually had the opposite effect going into it. I know I'm not good at it. So working at it and learning was exciting. You know, it was welcome. Um, and learning about my, my body and how to get the best out of it when I thought it had nothing to offer me in this regard was really eye opening. And I wanted to do that for other people. So I ended up being um, in a position where I had time and I figured out the funds to put myself in a program where I learned as much as I could about the human body as far as um, training people of all different kinds go, um, corrective exercises and just strength and conditioning and movement and functional movement. Um, 
all movement, all movement should be functional and learning about basic nutrition concepts and all that. Um, and that ended up being a really great few years of my life where I was devoted to that hundred percent, but I'm not going to, you know, I didn't have plans. I don't, I still don't have plans to open my own gym. So it just didn't really have anywhere to go. And I couldn't afford to keep doing that, to be totally honest. Um, so that, that was a, you know, an unfortunate while fortunate. Cause I have so many friends, um, from that time and they're probably all listening to this or like I've, I, most people listening to this, I've met through that. Uh, and it was a really great time. And it led me to, um, while it was, while it was absolutely wonderful, it required that I, I had to leave it because I couldn't afford to keep doing it. Um, cause it didn't quite cover the bills. Uh, so here I am thrust back into trying to find work. Um, and you know, a, a couple of jobs later, a couple of, of uh, bosses later, a couple of companies, different companies later, here I am talking at you guys right now. So, yeah. <laughs> I have a note right here that says, talk about your sad birthdays. <laughs> talk about my sad birthdays. There's only really two that, st that stand out. One was when I turned 30. This happened while I I wasn't a CrossFit coach yet. I was teaching kickboxing classes. And the day of my birthday, I, I taught class. I taught my, you know, whatever day of the week it was. So I taught my, my evening classes. Um, and that was my 30th birthday. I went, I went to Korean barbecue with like four of my friends or something. I don't know. Yeah, that was my 30th. Not that it was sad, but it kind of was a little, mm, it wasn't, it wasn't a big, made a big deal. Like it, yeah, it wasn't a made a big deal. Like I kind of wish I, I don't know, celebrated those things more for myself, but I didn't. Um, I was also kind of bummed out at the time because I had my heart broken just a few months, uh, one month actually prior to that. So it was kind of rough, but, um, so that's one sad birthday. And then, um, God, I remember, I mean, let, yeah, let's go back to college, I guess. Um, I remember, I think I turned 19 because it was my first year in college. I went to an art school. My dorm room, it was off campus, but it was a dorm still. Um, my dorm room was in the basement, so the windows didn't offer any light really. And it was September. So school had just started not too long before, maybe about a month and we were all still trying to find our, our friends, our people. And so I didn't quite have my established group yet to just, you know, get them all together and do something. And there wasn't a whole lot of social activities because it was an off-campus dorm. Um, everybody's spread out just doing whatever, going to house parties, strangers and stuff. Um, and I was, I remember sitting on the top bunk in my dorm, eating a chicken cup of noodle. At the time I was eating really healthy for a freshman because I had, um, a bad, a bad senior year. Oh my God. I can't believe I'm leaving this other like experience out in high school where I had my first like dating experience or whatever, uh, <laughs> with this garbage of garbage pail of a human being. Um, but I, I had a d an eating disorder to top, to top off everything that I, I had just told you um today about high school and my stuff and not knowing what the hell I'm doing with myself um I also had a little bit of a de eating disorder I don't know what kicked it off but I maintained it like something happened in which I, I was made fun of a lot like um for being really short 
And my name being Tina, it's very conveniently swapped out with tiny and teeny and all that. And it's endearing from some people and then annoying and gets really old from other people. But that was a thing. Um, so I was made fun of a lot. And I also was a little bit, you know, squishier than maybe some of my counterparts. Um, Asian families do that to you. They let you know, you know, when you're looking a little. So again, the theme of like not fitting into molds and whatnot. This is a physical mold. So it's quite a, quite a literal mold in a sense. Um, yeah. And also like ma being made fun of for being unusually pale. It's weird because I hold a tan really well now. I don't know what that means for the quality of my like skin health or whatever, but there was a period of time where I was very, very pale and, um, something happened where I lost a lot of weight and I had this boyfriend who had rich parents and he had two houses to go back and forth between because they were divorced and both houses had pools and hot tubs. And so I spent that entire time being completely like dealing with the fuck boy to be totally honest, but it was fun. I, I would drive my ass to Seattle all the time to hang out with him um, when he was treating me like dirt. But I got a tan. I got a tan. I got really skinny, and I stayed that way. Um, and so in college, I didn't want to risk that, so I didn't... I ate pretty... like I, I mean, I ate like a lot of hummus. I, I was basically a vegetarian. I ate a lot of hummus. I ate a lot of like sprouts and salad and pita with stuff in it vegetables tofu um why the fuck am i talking about tofu oh sad birthdays <laughs> yeah i gotta burp again my god sad birthdays cup of noodle so it was a treat is my whole point just my see, see this is why I have notes is because I go in circles but I treated myself on my 19th birthday to a cup of noodles chicken flavor that's the short version of the story I think that's the only sad birthday my 21st birthday I didn't have like a rate like I didn't I didn't go out I didn't rage my parents were in town they were visiting me and they took me out and I ordered a beer that was my 21st birthday which I'm actually, I'm pretty proud of that. That's pretty chill, pretty grown up of me. Um, but then I, you know, after that, I definitely got real shit faced consistently to make up for all the lost time. So that's good. Um, so yeah, so that's, so that's story time. I would love, love, love to hear stories from you guys. I mean, I'll let you know what topic is coming up. And if you would, you know, record a little video and DM me with the video, that'd be awesome. I would love to share your voice telling your stories um, on the show. That'd be really fun. Because uh, I, 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 it's about Obviously, it's my show, so it's about me. I'm not going to deny that. But it's also about you. You know, like I said earlier, we're going to talk about a lot of stuff. And I just want to have a laugh at our own expenses, you know? Because life is ridiculous. Life is hilarious. It could be so absurd. You, you don't, you can't write this stuff, but it happens. And we have to record it for history. We have to be able to share these things so that we all know that we go through this weird stuff. So fucking weird. So yeah, DM me your stories if you're not shy about your voice. Otherwise, you could just like write it out or something like that. Type it up. But it'd be, it'd be more fun to hear it coming from you guys. All right. Let's talk about some current events because why not? Things are happening in the world and uh, it's fun to talk about those things. Yesterday, well, by the time you first hear this, it will have been two days, but um, today for me, it's a Monday. Yesterday was the premiere of Game of Thrones season eight, the last season, episode one. I love this show, okay? I love this show just like everybody else, but 
let my inner curmudgeon come out for just a second. I don't know what it is, but when, when, when folks nerd out a little too much, um, about like fake stuff, like movies particularly, or shows, you know, like entertainment stuff, I get really annoyed. I mean, I love Game of Thrones enough that I'll partake, I will, but my tolerance for it, oh man, maybe just a few, a few hours at most, like the episode was last night, I, I, I chatted about it with some p- people and then by this morning, before I even got out of bed, I was so done. I was like, really? Like, let's just enjoy the show. Let's just like, let's just let the people who work so hard to make the show happen, just tell their story and I'll just go along for the ride. Like, I don't, why do we have to, why do we have to dissect everything and guess what's going on? I mean, I guess it's fun once everything is over to go back and have somebody point out all the details that you may have missed. That's kind of cool. And I, and I have a friend who does that, like, and that's, that's what he does. And I don't want to shit on that. Like, that's great. But I guess it's like people who don't do the research or, okay, there's two types of people. One, the armchair expert who, um, doesn't really know a whole lot. And I fall into this category if I do do this, but they just do cursory, cursory search or like investigate just on a very superficial level, just read a couple of lines of text from an article or something, or watch a couple minutes of a video and then just really stand firm in these theories. Um, and they have no business really arguing them. And then you have the people who want to flex people who want to flex and show that they know all this stuff and that they like have, you know, developed these ideas with the assistance of, of others really. But like they want to, they want to flex and in the, at the end of the day, if they're right, Oh, that's even better. That's what they want. And I, Oh man, I can't even be around it. It makes, it just sounds really shitty for me to say, cause I know you people listening to this are those are that you guys love stuff, but my inner asshole, <laughs> um, my inner curmudgeon, my inner grumpy old man just can't do it. It like, it, I like feel like irritated, you know, being around it. I don't really, I don't necessarily like being this way. This is just who I am. I don't even, I've never seen really any of the Harry Potters or maybe I've seen one because it was playing on TV, but it was out of order. So I don't, I didn't have any context for the story. I just, I just watched it as like moving images, um, to, to occupy my time for a while. Uh, Star Wars. I mean, the originals definitely watched those, but I, I can't, I, I haven't seen any of the new ones. No, that's a lie. I've seen, I'm not even going to say a title because I can't remember the exact title. That's how bad it is. But I haven't seen any of the new, the new films beyond the, 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 the one that kicked it off. Last Jedi. Is that right? Oh man. Sacrilege. But yeah, I haven't seen any of the things, even though there's like so many amazing female heroines and stuff. And like, how could you not? But I just can't. Crazy Rich Asians Asians is another one. I can't even say it. Crazy Rich Asians. Haven't seen that either. I get it. I support you all. Representation is everything. I'm all about that. Believe me. That's why I'm even doing this. And so I have a, I have representation on the internet. Um, but I, I didn't care to watch that either because I wouldn't even want, I wouldn't watch it anyway. It's not the kind of movie that I really care to watch. It looked it looked fucking corny. And I'm sure I've heard people say like, oh, it's really funny and everything. And I'm sure it has its moments, but oh God, a lot of the times when people tell me stuff is good, it actually isn't that good. I'm sorry. And I'm, I'm not saying that my opinion matters more than anybody. It's just mine and I can't help it. And I, I wish I, I wasn't so contrarian sometimes. It's just some weird knee jerk thing. 
So sorry, not sorry. Yeah. But anyway, um, Game of Thrones, that's what we're talking about. Jesus Christ. Good times. That's all I want to say about that. Notre Dame. Am I saying that right? I feel like I need, I need to try to say it correctly. Instead of Notre Dame. Notre Dame is burning. Hopefully they've contained it. Last I heard, they have. Luckily, it, um, it's undergoing renovation. So a lot of the, the art... A lot of the statues are in storage, so they, they are pre I, presumed to be safe from the flames, but they've been able to contain it. The spire, uh, I don't know if it collapsed quite yet, but it looked like it was pretty close to doing so, but they've been able to, to contain it for, for now, which I don't have a lot of feelings about it, unfortunately. Um, everybody's reacting to it on Facebook, I'm sure, because they visited, and it's history. That's it's significant. But I also, I I wish I cared. I'm I'm sure I would. I mean, okay, so I don't know. Again, it's my contrarian, curmudgeonly, whatever. Like everybody, I think. Okay, no, no. Let me let me. I'm realizing what's going on here. It is a tragedy that that happened to a historical landmark. It's history. It's it, not history like it's over, but like it's, it's like his, history. So it's significant. I have all the love for that. I think it's when people like, I'm calling people's bluff on how much they actually give a shit about things. Maybe not this topic particularly, but I'm saying just in general for a lot of stuff, when people like share things on Facebook and then they like have some kind of anecdote or some, some comment to, to go along with it. Um, I just don't really like what, do you really care that much or do you feel like you need to say something about it so that you're on record as having a position on it? That's, my, that's what I wonder, you know? I'm also jealous um, if you all have visited because I, I haven't and I, I had a chance. I had a chance and I missed that chance. So that's, I'm a little upset myself for that. I was in Paris for 24 hours. I was also sick as a fucking dog. Like I checked into my hotel and I was like, okay, it's only six in the evening or something. I'm going to rally. I'm going to go out there, have dinner, whatever. I really wanted to. I thought I was going to die. It was like the flu, I guess. I don't really get sick that often, so I don't know what it was. I've only, honestly, I feel like I've had food poisoning more often than, than the flu. But I was sweating, but cold and weak and dizzy and nauseous. And I was on a plane. Oh my God, it was so bad. So I'm I'm sad. If I had to do that all over again. And if I was fortunate enough to not be sick as I was, or even less sick, I would have totally gone because I had time to have dinner and then, you know, maybe stay, stay up all night or go out a little bit, wake up in the morning, do the sightseeing thing and then fly out. Um, so I'm sad to, if I, if I ever do get to see it, have to see it in its, um, you know, re rebuilt form and not the original, but I hope things are okay over there. And I hope, I know that one firefighter got hurt. Um, so hopefully that's it as far as injuries and, and, uh, stuff like that goes. What other, oh, Coachella. That's my third current event I have on my list. Um, God, I sound like such a like a, like a curmudgeon, really. Like it keeps, that word keeps coming back because there's no other way to describe it. There is something about festival, music festivals that I just can't really get into. I think, I think, well, one, it's expensive, right? So I'm not doing that. And then you're in the heat standing with a million people, um, 
and you just have to be on your feet all day and you and like, I don't know. I mean, I, I love, I would love to see, like, I would love to see Childish Gambino that like, that would have been incredible. And some other people that I'm really into. Um, but I wouldn't endure the rest of it for, for that. I wish I was like more fun, but yeah. And watching everybody like, you know, <laughs> dance around in the sun in their cute outfits. When, <laughs> when the fashion editorials come out and it's like festival season, festival season round, like look like, um, festival season outfit roundups and stuff like that. I, I can't, it's really hard to take in. I can't take it seriously. And I, I want to know what that's about. Like, why do I feel that way? Is it, is it because I, is that weird desire, like not desire, a weird, um, automatic reaction to, to be like the naysayer and the contrarian or whatever, but yeah, Coachella never have been, I'm not saying I'll never go, but VIP all the way. Give me, give me, um, a fan. Give me some AC. Give me, give me a mister. Give me a nice chair. Doesn't even ha- no, doesn't even have to be a nice chair. Just give me a chair. Give me a place to sit. Give me a beer, a nice cold beer. Give me some shade. Give me a, a decent view from from where I'm sitting of the stage, um, and we're good. That's a good time to me. Not standing up in the front and getting smushed. Nobody is is worthy enough for me to to deal with that shit. That's what, maybe that's what it is. Maybe it's the, the kind of the idol worship stuff. And I know some of you love that shit. And like, I'm so happy for you. I'm so happy for you that, that, that stuff brings you excitement and joy. Like I, I, I love that for you. I love it. But for me, I just don't give enough of a shit. That's the theme, I guess, is that I don't give a shit about a lot of things and I have to figure out what do I give a shit about? Uh, but yeah, Coachella, meh, but all the more power to you guys. So I, knowing this about myself, that I tend to be curmudgeonly, I definitely inserted a moment in the show that I'm going to call attitude of gratitude. So after all the garbage that I talk about, um, on the episode at the end, I always want to touch on anything. It could be like something on any level, any subject, any experience, big or small, that I'm grateful for, so that we end on a positive note. Because at the end of the day, even when it's funnier to be negative, positivity is how you should live your life. So I'm grateful for um, (laughs) meat and rice. (laughs) I went to Korean barbecue the other day with... um, my good friend Raf and a few other people. And, you know, I, 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 I try to eat really healthily. So when moments where you get to indulge happen, they're amazing. And there's something about grilled meats that have been marinated in delicious stuff and then eating it with some white rice and some pickled assortment of veggies and whatnot. It just is it's a lot. It brings me a lot of happiness inside, a lot of mouth pleasures, as I've heard it put one time um, by somebody. Mouth pleasures. I love mouth pleasures. So yeah, meat and rice, I'm really grateful for it. I'm also grateful for um, having people in my life in which we can talk a lot of shit. Like I keep saying, it's one of my favorite things to do because it's so fun. It's so funny. And it sounds like... I'm contradicting myself when I say that I'm trying to end things on a positive note and I talk about how I love to talk shit. I don't mean that in like it has to be a malicious thing and we're talking about people. Of course we are. But it's also just I'm what I am referring to when I say talk shit is I mean being brutally honest about life and people and things. And it's not really so much like wishing any ill will on anybody. Really, it truly isn't. I mean, nobody deserves that. It's more about um, looking at like stories and pointing out the things that could have gone better and gone worse and poking fun at 
our experiences, everybody, like I, the collective, you know, we, because that's how we learn, you know, gossip is a negative term, but it's, it's sharing stories like this over the fire is something that we've been doing since we first started making noises and we learn from each other. Um, so yeah, so that's what I hope to do in, in this modern version of that, which is why I really invite you to share your stories with me so we can talk about them. And by we, I mean me, um, but hopefully through the stuff that you share, that's how you participate too. So that would be fantastic guys. Thank you so much for listening. This was a lot of fun. If you've made it this far, I'm amazed just kidding. I know you had fun. Just as, just as, just as I did. I, um, want to do this pretty regularly. Um, next show, I think I want to make the topic, uh, be about fear. It's kind of a, it's kind of an extension of today, you know, because fear tends to drive a lot of our actions and how we you know, perceive ourselves and, um, our surroundings. And so that dictates a lot of our actions, but I also mean it on a very like visceral, simple, primal nature. Like, are you afraid of clowns? Are you afraid of the dark? Are you afraid of heights? I just want to talk about our fears. Um, and I want to hear some stories. I'll I'll try to share some stories too. I'm trying to think right now of when I've been scared shitless. Uh, but yeah, like, have you had some weird experiences as it relates to your biggest fears? I want to know, tell me, you can watch the video version of this podcast on YouTube. And if you follow me on Instagram at Tina bites, the link in bio will show you all the places where you can find me on the internet. Find me on the internet. How come I can't say that very clearly? Find me on the internet. Find me on the internet. Find me on the internet. I should do that before every show so I don't have a mush mouth. But yeah, follow me. Thanks for listening. Till next time, stay hungry.